Well, friends, I was 25 years old when I tore the meniscus in my knee playing basketball, and I was like a typical guy. I decided I'll just sleep it off. You know, why? I'm not going to a doctor. About three months later, with this swollen knee given out on me all the time, I, I broke down and went to a doctor. He said, you need surgery. I went and had the surgery, and he gave me a little bottle of pills, Tylenol 3s. There was only five or six of them, so they're like gold. You have to be careful with them. And I'm pretty stubborn. I thought, I don't like pain meds, so I thought, I'm not going to take them. And I didn't. But a few weeks later, Shelly was having this epic headache. Nothing was taking the edge off it. And I said, why don't you try one of my Tylenol 3s? Two amazing things happened. One, the pain went. Two, she was significantly happier. <laughs> like, Shelly is generally a very happy and pleasant person, but I could notice a difference. Like, her happy rate was ratcheted up with that pain med. And so over the course of the next year, she kind of polished off the five or four, four or five pills I did have. There weren't many, but every once in a while. Well, we got into this argument. We got into this big argument. It wasn't an epic battle or war, more like a border skirmish between young married couples, you know, people. And, and I'm, I got to admit, I got a little childish. I got a little childish because, probably because she was winning and she was making more sense than me. So in the middle of the argument, I said, why don't you go and take one of those happy pills of yours? <laughs> And I did it to tick her off, and I got to tell you, work like a charm. <laughs> work like a charm. You know, we all have a relationship when it comes to pain, and maybe even pain medications. There's all kinds of medications you can get. Acetaminophen, ibuprofen, morphine, codeine, aspirin. They all work a little differently, but they all accomplish the same thing. They mask a problem. They don't heal a problem. In fact, I, and let's, let's acknowledge, painkillers can be r great relief when you're heal in the process of healing. It can provide temporary relief that can be so helpful. But doctors will say the more you take them, the more they actually can become part of the problem. Well, we're in a series called Reassembling Life, and we're acknowledging that we all have a problem. All of us have a problem. Sin entered in creation. Our lives became broken, and pain entered into that. In week one, we talked about living the integrated life. And if you're going to reassemble your life, obviously the premise is everyone has to reassemble because something's broken in your life. First thing to acknowledge is that you're an integrated human being. That if you're hurting emotionally, it's going to affect you spiritually. If you're hurting physically, it's going to affect you mentally. We're an integrated life. We don't live with nice, tidy boxes as much as we try to live that way. We're integrated. Then we learned in week two that there's a battle for control in our minds. If you're going to live a reassembled life, it's going to all start here. That no longer do you need to be in control or you need to be out of control. You can now be under control. In fact, we are all under control. Either the flesh is trying to control you or the spirit is trying to control you. And the spirit leads to life and the flesh leads to death. Then last week, we learned about the power of sex. This beautiful, wonderful part of God's creation that affects every human being that we never like to talk about, do we? But that was a brilliant talk by Pastor Jessica last week as we saw the power and beauty of God's creative element and how we're all sexual beings. And yet, when it's not used properly, because it's so powerful, it does a lot of damage. This week, we want to talk about something that's a part of everyone's life too. I want to help you to see a future past pain. A future past pain. You know, I, I took this off, off our hallway. This is a fire alarm, smoke alarm or whatever, smoke alarm. It was in the hallway, and I took it down last night because I didn't want to forget it today, and I hid it because if Shelly knew I took it down, there'd be anxiety that maybe what, this is the day that something happens, right? You know, a smoke alarm just alerts you that something's wrong. That's all it does. It just alerts you that something's wrong. It might be as benign as your, your bread is burning in the toaster, or it might be as something serious as your apartment building is burning down. Uh, you know, pain is a lot like a smoke alarm. It alerts you that something's wrong. And it's never helpful to compare your pain with somebody else's pain, because we can trivialize our pain or trivialize their pain. The fact is, a smoke alarm doesn't distinguish between burnt toast or burning down apartment. It just alerts you something's not right. And pain's a lot like that. But here's what we do with our pain in our culture. We often do what I do with the smoke alarm. Have you ever taken the batteries out of your smoke alarm? 
when it's chirping, you have no batteries, so you, what do you do? You take it out. You take it out and you don't tell Shelly you did. That's what you do. All of a sudden, the fire alarm, the smoke alarm is so great. Yeah, because there's not, it's not working anymore. We do this in life. We take out the batteries or we turn up the volume of life so that it drowns out the pain of our life. Both of those strategies are what I would call masking strategies. They're masking strategies. Some of, some of us take the batteries out, and that's a type of denial. We live in denial of the pain that we are carrying in our life and how it affects us. If we don't hear it, we can't feel it, right? Well, whether or not you acknowledge you have past pain, it's showing. It's driving and fueling your temper. It's sometimes driving and fueling our addictive behaviors. It certainly drives our need for consumption of more, and maybe it contributes to the relationship grumpies you have. And it's all past previous pain. But some of us, we live in a state of denial. That another way is we turn up the volume of life. We live in a state of distraction. Instead of having to anything but to think about the pain or the mindsets or the past things that have happened to us, we'll doom scroll on our phones. Just doom scroll. Why? Because I don't have to think. You know what it's like to be all by yourself? This is the hard part about solitude and silence. You're alone with you. And that reveals a lot of where our pain is in those moments. But we mask it with doom scrolling. Some of us are chronic overachievers. We're always looking for the next dopamine hit to a win that helps us to minimize the pain of the past. But like a smoke alarm, it's not the problem. Pain is not the problem. Pain is pointing to a problem. Now, where does your pain come from? You know, pain comes from one of three areas, and this is how I'd like you to think of it today as we dive into your past, a place none of you want to go today, but we're going to go there. Pain comes into our life by, sometimes by sin done by you. It's sin we've done that has contributed pain to our life. Here's what happens a lot in my own life when, with sin and past sin. It can, it can begin to give life to things like shame and guilt and addiction and regret. Shame is like fertilizer. If you bury pain into shame, it's going to grow your pain and it's going to magnify your pain. It's going to become controlling in your life. Shame works this way. Shame is a big liar. I, I, I hate shame because shame will tell you this lie. It'll tell you this. You're the only one. You're the only one that's ever done this. Or it'll tell you this. If people knew this about you, they would have nothing to do with you. Shame just amplifies that. And that's what breeds a lot of the problems in our life. So sometimes it's sin done by us that contributes to pain. Sometimes it's sin done to you. Abuse. Trauma. An affair. Divorce. It all produces emotional pain. I, one of the byproducts of this, I've seen hundreds of people I've been involved with over the years, thousands now, I've watched a lot of people watch with, walk with such insecurity in life. So insecurity. Because past pain still has its teeth in them. Still has their teeth in them. And they can't shake. They, they, they either walk through life with very little confidence, or they walk through life with arrogance. They're overcompensating. One or the other. They walk through and they're overcompensating in life, or what they're doing is living a very small life. Never what God intended. Past pain is a way of telling your future, shaping your present. Then it's not just sin done by you or sin done to you. It's sometimes sin done around you, your family of origin, your culture, your country, your generation. It can create trauma and leave doors open to the evil one that loves to get in there, and he just amplifies any brokenness or toxicity in our life. He loves to distract us from the mission God has for us in life and certainly becoming the person God wants us to be in life. So think of pain in those three di dimensions. Something done by us, something done to us, something done around us. Something done by us, something done to us, something done around us. Okay, this is where people are going to start pushing back. He's going to be like, Jonathan, listen, I'm, if there's past pain, I'm managing it. I'm okay. What's the big deal? I like what Franciscan monk Richard Rohr says. He says this. He says, if we don't learn to transform the pain, we will most assuredly transfer the pain. This is what I did in my life. 
If we don't transform our pain, if we don't allow God to transform our pain, we will inevitably transfer our pain. Some of us are living with transferred generational pain. We find ourselves with brokenness. We know the person we want to be, and we can't quite be there. See, today I want you to do a very hard thing. I want you to open up your past, something nobody wants to do. Open up your past so you can create a future past pain. Now, I know if you're like me, right away you have some objections. Because for some of us, we see the past, and we have a relationship to the past as this. The past is the past. Anyone grown up with that? Often, that, I mean, that was my family of origins mantra. I mean, we're all like all, you know, overachievers, always trying to achieve in life. This is unproductive to open up the past. Why go and wallow? The past is the past. Isn't it bad to revisit the past, some people would say? I am saved. I'm a child of God. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Isn't it bad to visit the past? Like your family culture will determine how you deal with the past. Uh, my family culture was uh, bury it and don't talk about it and it's not real. It didn't happen. I mean, that was our strategy for it. It was unwelcome, unproductive. And so every time something from your past rears its head that's traumatic, a past trauma, a past divorce, an abortion, some promiscuity in your life, or a failure at work, or a wound by your dad, or a wound by your mom, there's a, you immediately go to verses like this one, the Apostle Paul says. He says, I focus on this one thing. Say it with me. Forgetting, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Yeah, forget the past. Look ahead to the victory of Jesus. Forget the past trauma, the past pain. Look ahead to the new creature in Christ Jesus you are, the victory of Jesus that you have. The only problem with quoting that verse is it's not what it really means. See, I always say this. If you want to read the Bible well, you've heard me say this many times. There are three principles to reading the scripture. One is context. Can you say that with me? Context. Number two is context. And number three is context. Context. It's not at all what Paul means in this verse. When he says this in this verse, he's talking about forgetting his past wealth and privilege, his past accomplishments and trophies. He's counting them as lost. They mean nothing to him now because he's leaning into a future in Jesus. It's quite different. He's not talking about forgetting past trauma here. We quote verses all the time that that's not at all what they're teaching us or helping us to see. See, fact, the fact is, your present has been shaped by your past, and your past and present will shape your future. It will shape your future. That's why dealing and moving beyond past pain will help you build a life that's more confident, a life that's freer, a more generous life, because you don't need to keep score anymore. There's so many good things that come when we actually lean in and deal with this. See, you and I are shaped from where we came from. So that can be good news and that can be bad news. It doesn't need to determine our future, but we need to acknowledge that we've been shaped a little bit from that. I've been shaped by my family of origin. Every time I've seen a counselor, they always go through my family of origin. And I always love it when they go, well, that's interesting. <laughs> I, you know, I don't love it. I hate it when they do it, because I know I'm going to have to talk about that part in my family story. Because the future is determined by the past, and our present has been shaped by our past. So it's our family of origin, it's the culture, it's the socioeconomic status we had growing up, it's the key events of your childhood, could be a death of a mom, death of a dad, could be a divorce, someone abandoned you in those moments. It could be even great things that affect your present and future. You were born into a family that followed Jesus and put that in front of you, or you're born into a family that valued education and gave you an opportunity. There's good and bad in everybody's family, no perfect families. Good and bad in everyone's families. And as we grow up, if we're blind or we live in denial of these things, we won't get past our past pain. I like what Sarah Dressen says, the author. She says this, your past is always your past. Even if you forget it, it remembers you. Your past is always your past. Even if you forget it, it remembers you. So the first thing that we push back and we don't want to deal with the past is because the past is the past. The other thing I think is, works right alongside of it is the past can't be changed. 
I can't change the past. I can, I can change the present, and I can shape the future, but I can't, I can't predict the future. But I know this, I can't go back and change the past. So there's a little bit of us that pushes back, if we're honest, and says, listen, I don't want to open that can of worms of the past because I can't change any of it. But what if you could change the hold it has on you? What if that's what could change? You can't change the facts of your story, but what if you could change the hold that it has on you? And this is about the time somebody should say, like, Pastor Jonathan, you're sounding a little bit like a therapist right now. <laughs> I came to church for Jesus. <laughs> what are we doing here? What, what, what's this doing? But remember, we're an integrated human being. We are an integrated human being. We, our emotions, our wounds, our pain, our trauma affect us spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, and relationally. It affects us all the way around. I like how the pastor, Pete Scazzaro from New York City, put it. He said, in emotionally healthy churches, people understand how their past affects their present ability to love Christ and others. It does. I mean, some of our past keeps us in that great worship gathering, Natalie and Maki leading us. We can't fully enter in. Why? Past pain. It's made us live a very curated and careful life, so we dare not abandon ourselves to worship. We need to control everything. Why? Because it gives us comfort. Our past has shaped our present. It pushes us in ways we don't even imagine. I, I think of it this way. Jesus might live in your heart, but your pain lives in your bones. It's there, and it's telling a story. So what patterns exist in your life? What patterns exist in your life that you avoid, and you're trying to avoid this past pain? You don't want to talk about it. But we can't change the power of our past pain if we don't first acknowledge it. A few months ago, Shelly and I were cleaning out things in the basement. Um, it's all the stuff we dragged around through three or four provinces we lived in. And you know those boxes you just got to bring with you, but you never open them up when you do? We had plenty of those. And one of them is a, a box a little bit like this, and it has pictures of when my boys were little, when they were really little. Little pictures of them, yeah, they're just so cute. Oh, there's, they're so cute. There's, here's, oh, get the little teddy bear. And Shelly likes looking at these pictures. Here's us as a young family. This is when our firstborn was just born. And I don't like looking at them. They make me really sad, actually. Shelly doesn't like me looking at them because I get very melancholy. Because I don't just see a moment where my kids were young and cuddly. And when I went a different era, I see moments that I missed. See, I've, I've been hurt pretty bad at a place I had worked at, and I lost my confidence. And I began to overwork, overwork, overwork trying to compensate, trying to prove to people that aren't even looking at me that I'm worth something, that, that my life has value, that I have some ability here. And I worked and overworked and I overlooked. And when I look at those pictures, sometimes it's hard, guys, I'll tell you, because I see the pain I transferred to my children and the pain I transferred to my, my, my spouse, my wife of 30 years. I thank God for their grace. Thank God for time and and therapy and counseling and prayer. But that's real pain. It's hard to open a box and look at what, where your pain is. But I will say this, it's important to look in a box, to acknowledge where your past pain is so you don't have to live with its effects the rest of your life. This is really important. So let's get into scripture. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter five. I'm gonna read a bit of a story, and it's a woman who finds a future past pain. It's incredible how this all, uh, uh, maybe it's familiar to some of you, you read it before. Typically, I, I love this, uh, it, 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 the main character in the story is Jesus. And he's on the way to doing something. He's a busy man. He's going to heal a little girl. He's on his way to do that, and he gets waylaid by somebody else. It's Mark chapter five, verse 24. Let me read it to you. If you have a Bible, please follow along. Jesus went with him, the person who wanted their daughter healed, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Everybody wants to see what's going to happen. Then it says, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. 
Just pause there. When you think the average age at this time would have been in their 30s and 40s, there wasn't a lot of longevity. That's a big portion of your life, to live suffering in that pain. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. I just imagine her courage. You know, I, I think of her courage of just thinking about that moment. I hear Jesus is coming. I've heard what he does. I, I'm going to sneak up behind him. Just touch him. Just touch his cloak. So she came up behind him through the crowd, touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can touch his robe, I will be healed. Verse 29, immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed from her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd, and he asked, who touched my robe? Now imagine for a moment you're this woman. And the Torah says that you're unclean because if there's blood flowing from your body, you are called unclean. You are not to touch anybody. So you, she's not supposed to be in a crowd. She's not supposed to touch a man in public unless it's her husband. That was the law. It's a patriarchal society at that time. So she's, she's breaking that law. Not just that, you're not supposed to touch a holy man, a rabbi, and she touches him. I mean, she's breaking every rule in the book. I'd love to do a series someday on rule breakers. I think of the Phoenician woman who comes to Jesus before it was time to hear the message for the Gentiles, and she breaks all the rules to get in there, and Jesus indulges her. I'd love to do a series on that, breaking the rules, and when Jesus says, good on you. Here she is breaking all the rules. Why? Because she's desperate. This woman is very desperate. My guess is she probably is hiding her face under her shawl, she probably has it covered because if someone knew her in a crowd, this would be a catastrophe. I'm sure she is so scared that day thinking, I'm going to touch a man in public, in a crowd, I'm going to rub shoulders with others, and a holy man at that, she's probably scared to death. And then Jesus looks around and says, who did it? Who did it? Now, wouldn't you have just run away? I mean, I would have been sliding right out of there. You know that meme of Homer Simpson going into the thing? Like, I would have been sliding right out of there. I don't want to see. But Jesus just sort of sits there, and I like to think it was awkward silence. Some people, I wonder how many people are comfortable. Comfort, you feel comfortable in awkward silence. I, I've known, I had a friend once, and he just could not talk sometimes. And I found it very awkward sometimes as I waited on him to carry his end of the couch. <laughs> you know, you, can you pick up your end of the couch in this conversation? He sits there in awkward silence and he waits. And then in verse 33, it says, Then the frightened woman, remember these adge adjectives, frightened, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him. I mean, she's scared here. And told him what she had done. Verse 34. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Say this out loud with me. Your suffering is over. Man, can you imagine hearing those words from Jesus? Your suffering is over. I love this story. But it bothers me too. Probably like it bothers you. Why would Jesus embarrass this woman? Why would he stop and call her out in front of everyone? She's scared and embarrassed, and she's very vulnerable in this moment because of the patriarchal society. The chips are stacked against her already when she woke up as a woman, let alone being unclean, touching a man, touching a holy man. Why would he call her out like this? Why didn't he just give her a little wink, a little nod, like, I know, I know it was you. Or why, not, why didn't he just give her like, I'll call you later, we'll talk later. He doesn't do that. In front of everybody that's present, he says, who did this? Who did this? Why expose her in front of the community? Well, there's something hidden in the text here that's very helpful. We see first that she is healed when she touches his robe, right? She receives her physical healing in that moment. 
But remember, she's an integrated human being. Jesus wants to heal more than just her body. And so Jesus, it's interesting, when in the verse, when it says that she's, the suffering is over, that it has made you well, that's the same word for salvation. Jesus uses the same word to say she's healed for salvation, which means your whole being is made well. When did that happen? After the community around her found out about her. See, Jesus is doing something very unique here. He is healing all of her. Twelve years of pain is not just a physical thing anymore. This woman has been robbed relationally. For years, she's been unable to go into the temple. She was unclean. She wasn't be allowed. She's been unable to be with crowds. She has to be very careful who she's around. So relationally, she has lost all the joy of being in community with other people, the joy of celebration together, the joy of gathering in a, in a meeting like this and worshiping God together. She's had none of that. There's deep pain relationally here. The, her past pain had robbed her psychologically. Can you imagine the hope she would have felt with every new doctor? I heard about a doctor in Bethlehem. You know, he's got a cure. She spends all her money, only to be disappointed again. Hopes get up. There's a, there's a new cure here. There's a new spice available here. Uh, you know, this, the turmeric will heal you, whatever it is. And all of a sudden, to realize it couldn't touch the chronic condition that she was in. Psychologically, can you imagine how wounded she is? How about spiritually? How many prayers... In desperation, she had lifted up to God. I wonder how many of them were negotiations. God, if you do this, I'll do this. I'll, I'll do everything. You ever been that desperate? And they went unanswered. And she's a good Jewish woman. She knows that Jehovah Rapha means God who is my healer. And not, nothing is happening here. So Jesus is not just interested in healing your body. He knows that that past pain will follow her in life even after her body is healed. And some of us, it's our past family trauma. It follows us in life even after that person can't tra traumatize us anymore. Even after we've been removed from that situation. Even after somebody has already gone on. They're, they're dead now and they, they can't get to you. But they're still as real. You're taking walks with them every day in your mind. They're affecting who you are. Jesus wants to heal the past and the present. So she will have a future past pain. See, you know what's happening here is she touches Jesus and then Jesus makes her touch the community. Her healing is not just in Jesus, even though it comes through Jesus, it always does. Jesus chooses to use a community to heal us of communal sins, communal trauma, relational brokenness. He chooses that for us. And in that moment, shame is vanquished. It's gone. She's, she needed a community, she needed Jesus, and she needed a community, and shame and the power of shame is broken in her life. See, when you're dealing with pain, you need Jesus, and you need a community around you. You do. If when you're dealing with pain, if you're online, you need to touch Jesus, and then you're going to notice that Jesus automatically wants you to touch a community. He wants you to be a part of something. He wants you to be a part of other people. We can't do it alone. Creating a future past pain requires a community and often requires... Ah, oh, you knew I'd go there, right? I don't know what it is about how this works, but I understand that God designed us to be with people, not alone. If you're not in a community group here at One Church Duo, I'd really encourage you to be. Community is not what we're doing here on a Sunday morning. This is an aspect of community, but we're a crowd, right? And if you're like me, I'd rather float in a lobby than I would be sitting in a circle. I, this is the, the, the lie that is me. I sound very open here because I'm controlling my conversation with you because we're not really having a conversation, I'm speaking. It's because I, I, I really struggle opening up. It took years of Shelley and a counselor to help me to be more open. In conversations with close friends, I have a way of making it about them. 
turning it back to them because I'm not interested in answering questions about me. Why? I'm hiding in plain sight. And some of you are doing the exact same thing. And the problem was, is I was carrying all of this past pain with me. I carried it for years. It affected so many parts of my life. Was I saved? Did I know Jesus? Yes, I did. I knew Jesus. But I didn't recognize that often, not just the community, God uses a community to heal us, but often he uses even good therapy. If you've never been in therapy, there's always this moment where you're, you're, you're taking a step to see a good therapist. And we have a great curated group of faith-following, Jesus-loving, qualified psychologists and therapists and psychotherapists that we can connect you to. In fact, if you scan the QR code, code or in the chat room, there's going to be a button. The first two things are going to be, help me find a therapist, help me find a group. And I'm hoping hundreds of you scan it this weekend. Because why would you want to live a life forward carrying all that weight with you? I wouldn't want to. Why, why live that life? What's the alternative? We keep living the way we're living, and we keep getting what we've gotten. And the people around us keep getting our residue pain. There's a better way to go at this. There's a better way that we can move ourselves forward. Now, to be clear, I get why we are resistant. Who wants to open a, a can of worms, right? It's going to cost you something just like it costs this woman, but it will change your future. I guarantee you, it will change your future. This is one of the few places, I think, that nobody woke up today and said, you know what I'd like to do today? Let's rehash the past. You know, let's, let's talk about that thing that happened 20 years ago that I've never wanted to talk about. Nobody woke up doing that. Nobody woke up saying, this is what I'm looking forward to today. If we could just talk a little bit about how painful the past was, that'll make me feel better. <laughs> no one does that. But friends, mark my words, a healthy church will always lead you to places that you don't naturally want to go. A healthy church will always talk about things you don't naturally want to talk about. A healthy church will always value transformation over inspiration. A healthy church will be a church where it's okay not to be okay. And I got to tell you, as, as the one that God called just to be your leader in this season, I'll tell you, I'm way more concerned about the health of our church than I am the growth of our church. The health is what matters. Jesus came to set captives free. Why would we live in bondage to our past? He has set us free. We're no longer under the penalty of the sin. Why live with the residue of the sin? Why live with the toxicity and the brokenness of the sin? We're not a perfect church, but we are endeavoring to be a healthy church. In the story, Jesus connects this woman. She, this woman connects to Jesus, and then this woman connects to community. I think I'm talking to a group of people that a lot of you have connected with Jesus. And many of us have not connected to community. We took one step, and we'd rather a private religious moment with Jesus by ourselves to take care of all of this. But he didn't give it to this woman, and he was right in front of her. Why would he give it to you? Because he wants to use community to heal us, to banquish loneliness, to take care of those things that are climbing on top of us, those things that, the insecurities that drive us. He wants to use community to heal us. So I wonder how many young adults have never come to our young adults group. Just, I don't need to. I wonder how many seniors have not participated in our seniors ministry. Because I don't need to. I wonder how many adults that you're busy, you've got a lot going on. I never connected to a community group, never connected to a moment. Why? I don't need to. Friends, we all need to. There's not one of us that can do it by ourselves. May God give you the grace and strength to do the hard work of stepping into community or finding a therapist. Why? Christ has forgiven you. He's already touched you. He's already saved you. But we're living with that residue in our life. And it is showing. If you can't see it, ask the people that love you and know you best. So here's my plea to you. Stop dragging around the pain and the brokenness unpacking it in every new relationship and every new workplace. Let's heal. Let's all heal. We're all a little broken, and we all desperately need it. I invite it, I'm going to invite you now to get ready for communion. If You can pull out that little emblem. If you're online, just grab whatever it is that Pastor Dan mentioned. Maybe you grab a cracker or something to drink. 
I'd love you to grab that communion. I'd like you to take that wafer out, if you would, immediately. There's a beautiful prophecy given by the prophet Isaiah, and he's talking about the coming of the Messiah. And listen to these words. Does this not resonate with us today? It says, surely he took up, and this is Jesus, our pain and carried our sorrow. Jesus took up our pain. He carried our sorrow. And yet, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced, broken, pain introduced to his life for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So this wafer represents Jesus' broken body. When he gathered his disciples just before the cross, he took the bread and he broke it. Go ahead and just break it. And in this moment, we're acknowledging that's us. We're broken. The beautiful thing is Jesus was broken so we could be put back together again. So when we take this, we're acknowledging that Jesus was like a pain sponge. And he absorbed all of our pain, all of our iniquity, all of our sorrow. You don't have to live with that controlling you anymore. Just as sin no longer has power over you, your pain doesn't have to control you anymore. So as we take this, we take this acknowledging that Jesus came to make us whole. Let's take this together. I invite you to take the cup if you would. He said in verse 6 of that same chapter, Isaiah writes, We all, like sheep, we've all fallen short of his glory. We've all done sin, friends. All of us have done sin. We've done sin. Sin has been done to us. Sin has been done around us. Each of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. So all that regret that drives our insecurity, all that regret for past things we've done, it's under the blood. As far as the east is from the west, it's been forgotten. So it's time we let it go. It's time we let it go. Let's take this in celebration of the fact that grace is greater than sin. Hallelujah. 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 His grace is greater than our sin. I'd invite you to stand if you would in this room. And as we do, I'm going to invite our elders to come forward and just form a prayer line at the front of our church. In a moment, whether you're online, there's elders available there, people willing to pray for you if you just press the prayer button. If you'd like an elder to pray with you, our elders are going to come to the front at the end of our gathering. Maybe you're just carrying a lot of past pain. And it's time to do something about it. I will tell you this. Don't take a trip to the altar to have an elder pray for you as a way of not scanning the QR code to find yourself in a group or in therapy. Listen, we're going to pray that God does something supernatural in your life. But I know I've been in counseling two or three times in my life, and I can't tell you what it did for me. You want a whole leader. You want a healthy leader because otherwise it's a damaging, toxic thing. You want to be healthy. You want to lead into health in your next chapters. So I'm praying that some of you go to the Next Steps Lounge. You can do it there. Of course, you can, you can do all of our next steps. You can give. You, you can, you can uh, uh, find a group. You can find a therapist. Just scan that code. Take that step. I dare you to have the courage to do this so you don't have to have the same conversation a year from now, you're free. Can you imagine being free from the shame? Free from the guilt? Free from all the trauma of what someone's done to you? Free, free, free. That's what Jesus offers us today. So I'm gonna read this benediction, close in prayer. Our elders are gonna be available to pray with you. If you, you take that next step, you can go to the Next Steps Lounge. Some of you may want to sit in your uh, pew, scan that QR code, and take that step into community or into therapy.
to get healed and get better on the other side. Let this be our benediction. This comes from Acts chapter 20. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. May the peace of God enfold us. May the love of God uphold us. And may the wisdom of God control us. Father, be with your people. Help us to be your people, God. Set us free. Break those chains. May the walls come down. Give us the courage like this woman had to touch you. And give us the courage to stand in the pocket of community so that they can know who we really are and shame can be gone forever. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Love you, church.